Yes, thank you, Sophie. Uh, it's a very high-tech um, presentation. I have two computers operating, and I have two microphones on me, so if I'm a bit schizophrenic, you'll understand why. Oh, uh, the flip chart is... is uh, yes. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I hope, uh, at the very least, I will share some of my enthusiasm for the Book of Revelation. I deliberately chose a title that was as unsensational as possible, because... <laughs> I want this to be a very serious, low-key reflection. Um, if I get out of sync with my pres slides, it's because I'm trying to remember which one to press at the right time. I'm sure over breakfast you spent thumbing through the book of Revelation just to make yourself familiar with it, right. Let's, let's begin somewhere else. Let's begin in the parish of Sherborne. This is Evershot, a lovely little Dorset village, very quaint. The pub in the middle there is the Acorn, which occurs in Hardy's Tess of the Durbervilles, and Hardy himself, who, when he was an act, practicing as an, as an architect, built an extension to uh, the Summer Lodge Hotel, which is round the corner. This is Dorset, this is local, this is us. If you go just through Evershot, the, the village is marked by a river, a little stream, and there's a bridge over there. And on that stream is, get them both going together, a sign. Any person willfully injuring any part of this county bridge will be guilty of felony and upon conviction liable to transported for life transportation for life I just want to say I'm reading all the slides not because I don't think you can read but because it's being recorded and I've sat through presentations where the reader, the speaker didn't read the slide and it was very interesting because everybody else could hear it but I didn't know what was going on transportation for life which was a practice it's, was, it, it, um, it's only in, up until 1868 they finally did got it away with transportation for life. 1868, less than 150 years ago. It wasn't common practice and from, our, uh, from the middle of the 19th century onwards. But not that long ago, it was felt perfectly reasonable to transport one of our citizens, someone who would live down the road from us, for life if they damaged a bridge. Now, I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm not saying they were right. I'm just saying we go back a very short time, 150 years isn't very much, and we are almost in a different world already. This is Dorset. This is 150 years ago. Book of Revelation is 2,000 years ago and was written in the Middle East. So don't expect it to look like the sort of worldview we inhabit today. Because if something like that can be so different in a short time, the book of Revelation will appear to us very different. It's very confusing. I like that one. <laughs> Low. So, what do we have some ingredients in our book of Revelation? We have a prophet called John. We have the seven churches in Asia Minor, and they're then given to the named. There are seven angels, seven lampstands, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven plagues, seven this, seven that, some, something else. And a beast with seven heads. And a few other beasts with various numbers of appendages also. There's rivers of blood, um, up to bridal length it describes them in one. So that's quite a lot of blood really. There's a woman in the sky who's given a pair of wings. There's the whore of Babylon. And there's the end of the world. So it's a fairly you know, rich diet if you want to read the book of Revelation. It's a fairly rich diet. And, you know, is it scary or is it a bit comical to you? But, uh, you know, it, gives, it, 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 it is a gift for artists because it's so graphic. It's so graphic. Read the book of Revelation, and what are you looking for? If whatever you're looking for, you can probably find it. That's one of the things about the book of Revelation. That's why it's such a interesting book. That's why it's such a controversial book. That's why it's a book which is used by lots of people on, shall we say, the fringes. You can find prediction if you look for it. You can find history, because they're real people and real places. You can find self-justification because whichever side is right, that's me. And whichever side is wrong, that's you. <laughs> Arcane knowledge. 
you know there's lots of numbers and and colors and bits and pieces which you can have a field day on conspiracy theories don't we love conspiracy theories codes you can change numbers into words and and lots of other things so and the book of the apocalypse you'll find it in ufo You'll find it in Atlantis Studies. You'll find it in The Abominable Snowman. You can find it everywhere. There's a friend of mine, G.K. Chesterton. I rather like G.K. Chesterton. And though St. John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creatures so wild as one of his own commentators. Okay. So expect people who comment on the book of Revelation, uh, myself accepted, of course, uh, to be fairly wild and fantastical and bizarre. So, the reason we're here today, what I hope to do in this next 51 minutes is just look at the origins of the book, what sort of a book it is, why it's in the Bible, why is it so controversial, and why bother Book of Revelation probably comes from the end of the first century. It certainly is well known and talked about at the beginning of the second century. So it's, it's anything from 70, 80, 90, 95. There are, there are various suggestions, uh, even perhaps earlier than 70. 70. 70 is the date of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And for any scripture study, that's a very significant date. Because the temple features... In all of the history of the Old Testament and all the history of the New Testament, the the place of the temple. So its destruction is significant. The book of Apocalypse, probably written afterwards, but there are some who would suggest it might be written even before. It's an apocalyptic writing. Apocalyptic is a type of writing. It's a genre. And we have lots of examples of it. It's not the only one. One of the reasons why Revelation um, attracts a lot of attention is because it's the only example of apocalyptic writing that people have read. Whereas there's a lot of apocalyptic writing. There's apocalyptic writing in the other parts of the Bible, Book of Daniel. There's a lot of monsters in Daniel. There's, in the Synoptic Gospels, we have some apocalyptic writing. In, in Matthew chapter 24 and, and the parallels, Jesus talks of the end of the world and things will be shaken. The sort of readings we often have at the beginning of Advent. In, 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 the, in the Gospels, and, and at the end, at the end of the uh, liturgical year, so in November, December, we, we we have these readings from the Scriptures, from the Gospels, and it's a, it's very much the you know, things will change. There will be wars and rumours of wars. The skies will darken, and you will hear all these things, but the end is not yet, says Jesus. And then there's other writings which are not in the Scriptures, which, which are around. So there are books like there are books of Enoch which are apocalyptic writings. And there are other writings uh, in, in, in the Middle East that also are apocalyptic. So there are other writings around. So it's not, it's not a totally unique book in itself. It's in the Bible because it's ascribed to John. We talk about the apocalypse of John or the book of Revela- the Revelation according to John. Now, John is... Um, there's, a, there's a John in the Gospel. There's a John who wrote a Gospel... And there's a John who wrote some letters. And there's the John who wrote the evangel- uh, the, writes the, the book of Revelation. Most scholars would say they're probably not all the same person. I'll leave that, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of reasons why they do that. But there are, there are, dis- there are discussions about who this is. But it's, the early church saw John and they saw, we have other books by John. We have other writings by John. Let's look at this one and take it seriously. It's also because... The church saw in the book of Revelation something of its faith, of its belief. It's very important to remember that the church comes before the Bible, if you follow me, if you want to to put it crudely, the New Testament. The New Testament is put together by the church. It's not there already. So when people come along at the end of the first century, they flick through their Bible and say, well, that's the Old Testament, that's the New Testament. They're all put together much later than that. They're all put together much later than that. So they're put together and they're put into the, what we call the Bible or the canon of scripture because people said, this, this is about our faith. This is true. This is something that we believe. This is something that we believe and we understand to be the faith we live. I'll talk a bit more about that. It's controversial because it's, it's been used a lot in polemic. You know, when you talk about 
your enemies and you use language and images from the book of Revelation, it's a really handy tool chest. So you really want to say to someone, you're a really nasty person. You, know, you call them the beast of the apocalypse, or you call them the whore of Babylon, or you call them 666, whatever. So yeah, it's, a, it's a useful source of polemic. That's why it's controversial. And we bother because it's, because it's in the Bible. We bother, bother because it's seen to be something of God's faith. So Catholics... Orthodox, Protestants, other Christians recognize in the book of Revelation part of the scripture. There are other, Bibles, other books of the Bible we don't share with Orthodox or with, 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 with uh, Protestant Christians, but we all share the book of Revelation. And we all believe that somehow it speaks God's word, even though it may speak it rather differently from other ways. So, what are we doing today? What do I want to do today? Well, we could study the scripture. So I could say to you now, get out your Greek Bibles and we'll go through it and we'll, we'll do some really serious scripture study. And some of that is important. We'll probably do a bit of that. Not Greek Bibles, don't worry. Uh, it's history. It is about history. Because it's, a, it's set in a time and a place. And if we want to understand a time and a place, we have to understand the history of it. You know? Just as to understand any of you... I'd have to know a bit of your history. I'd say, where are you from? Who's your mum and dad? Where did you go to school? To get us an understanding, we need a bit of the history. But it's not the main purpose of today. Pastoral. What does the book of Revelation, how does it impact on you and me? How does it address my life issues? That's the reason I want to look at Revelation. That's the reason I find it a really exciting, interesting book. Because it talks to me about the things that matter to me. I like to study it as a piece of ancient literature. I like to study it as a historical document. But the reason I really want to study it is because I think it speaks to me in my situation today. And I hope you'll find that's true. Two great themes of the book of Revelation, judgment and justice. John addresses seven particular churches. And when I say churches, I mean little communities in seven cities in Asia Minor, as we would call it, now modern-day Turkey. There are seven little communities, and he writes to them, to all seven of them. And he uses a fantastic visionary language and imagery. But what he does all of that for is for two reasons. One is to promise salvation to the poor and the oppressed. And the other is to challenge, to challenge the secure and the comfortably off. You remember the, there's the, those phrases like uh, the purpose of the gospel is to comfort the, uh, comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. You know? And that's what, in a way, John is trying to do. That's what he wants to do. Those who are feeling life is very difficult and hard and they're struggling, is it worth going on? He wants to encourage them and support them. And those who are thinking, well, it's all very nice. I, I'm very comfortable off. Thank you very much. I, I quite like this religion thing. He's saying, you know, you should be, uh, you should be challenged if, you're, if that's where you are. That's why I think it's relevant. Because there are still, as we know perfectly well, lots of people who need comforting. Lots of people who need the promise of salvation. Who need to be supported in their difficulty, in their struggle. And there's also plenty of people who are quite comfortable, thank you very much, who need to be challenged by the gospel. What do we know of John? We, most scholars nowadays would just call him John of Patmos. Patmos is the, the, the island where he writes this, 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 this message, this book. Uh, and they do that just to distinguish this author from any other Johns that we mentioned beforehand. So... And what do we know about him? Well, as I said, most scholars would say he's probably not the apostle. And he's not the writer of the gospel. And he's not the writer of the letters. And one of the reasons for that is that the language is very different. The Greek is very poor. You know, just as in, if you you write in English, you can have a wonderful style. And you can have pretty average style. And you can have fairly scrappy English. But the writer of the book of Revelation, his his control language, his, his, his imagery is fantastic. But his Control his grammar is not particularly good. So that way it's not him. Where does he come from? There's a, a, a strong theory that he might come from 
um, might, have, might have been there at Jerusalem or in Palestine at the fall of the, of the temple. Because the imagery, imagery of, of disaster and collapse and, and, uh, and ruthlessness is, is, is ingrained in there. And the suggestion that he might have carried that with him, that traumatic experience. You know, at the moment we're, we're going through, a cele- not celebrations, but we're going through mem- remembering the First World War, the Great War. And how those memories scarred people and changed the world view. Traumatic events change people's way of looking at things. It would make sense if you'd been through a trauma, a great trauma, that you might write something like the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. So there's there's a reason why that's suggested. And why does he write the book? He writes it for Christians who might give up. You know, it's just not worth it. It's just so awful. Let's find another religion which, is, which promises a bit more. He writes for Christians who might compromise. Well, let's just, let's just make do with what's going on. Let's, let's, not, let's not, you know, uh, the Italians have a phrase, sono cattolico, ma non fanatico. I'm a Catholic, but not a fanatic. You know? so, so we might just say, well, let's just, you know, all this justice and peace and loving your neighbor. Well, let, we could put that to one side for a little bit and just get on with the, just, you know, clocking up the novenas. Um, <laughs> People might compromise. People might forget. Or they might become uh, comfortable with a contemporary world. Those, to me, ring lots of bells. You know? One of the things I... I, And I do as someone who who likes to compromise. And I I want to be comfortable. You know, I want a quiet life. I don't actually want to go to the stake for anything. Thank you very much. Uh, But... So it's real. It's real. John calls himself a prophet. I think that's an important thing to remember. Six times in the book of Revelation, he calls himself a prophet and he calls the writings a prophecy. So he doesn't see himself as a a visionary, he sees himself as a prophet. And remember what a prophet is traditionally in the Old Testament. Prophets are called and commissioned. You think of uh, Isaiah in the temple, here I am, send me, we hear of, think of Jeremiah, you know, who takes the scroll and eats it because he's commissioned. We think of, you know, these are people who are called, Moses in the desert, called and commissioned to speak God's word, to speak to God's word today to the people they meet. They tend to be uncompromising. They are there to challenge, and they often offer a minority issue. I, think of, I always think of Jeremiah in the mud. Jeremiah is the prophet who speaks out and they don't like it so they drop him in a well that's now dried up and he's up to his knees in mud because he's, get him out the way. You can't kill him because he's a prophet. Just get him out the way. But Jeremiah won't compromise. He wants to challenge. And that's what John is doing. So read the book of Revelation as if this is someone who's not concerned about what might be happening in hundred years time or a thousand years time or two thousand but someone who wants to speak God's word and challenge today seven cities there they are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea and, and then there's the island of Patmos they're just, they're just a little area relatively close to each other not, not next door to each other, but the sort, of, the sort of cities that would have a relationship with each other, trade routes, communications. Well-known cities, they were known at the time. They'd, they'd, been, they'd been around for hundreds of years. They'd had you know, various histories, all of them, but they were established communities in which there were Christian churches. And the church in each of them is addressed in the letters. So, there they are. There's seven... Seven is one of those numbers we'll have see a lot of in the book of Revelation. It's, it's a, seven in scripture tends to mean a whole, the total. It's, it's, it's the fullness, it's a unity and as a number. They're significant. They're real places. We know about them. We know about them because there's historical records about, you know, in this town, so-and-so was the proconsul at this time, and there was a big market development, and they built a big temple over here in, to Diana in Ephesus, and they, and they did this in Sardis, and this was what was happening in Pergamon. So we know from other writers what was going on in these cities, and we know quite a lot about them. So they're not just plucked out the air 
and they're quite close to each other. So it's fairly clear, and when we look at it a bit later on, it's fairly clear, John is actually thinking about seven real places and real communities. Just as if he were to go around the parishes you come from and said, I'm going to write a letter to, you know, to, to, to St. Austell and to Bridport and to Sherborne and to, you know, Caddington. And I'm going to, so it's the real places he's writing to. And John knows them. And they have different strengths and different weaknesses. Some of them, two of them get lots of praise. That's Smyrna and Philadelphia. Some of them get some praise and some criticism. That's Ephesus, Pergamon and Thyatira. And some really just get a serious rollicking. And that's Sardis and Laodicea. They just get told off. It's just, you know, it's, it's, the report says, not good enough, must try harder. And they are the audience for the whole book. Sometimes we read Revelation as if this is just an appendage at the beginning. It doesn't really belong there. The real bit is about the visions in heaven and the visions of the monsters. and all. The seven churches and the letters are the real audience for the, whole, for the whole book. All of it relates to them and the people in them. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have to do a little bit of interpretation. We're very familiar with Jesus' parables. I could probably say to you, quote us a few parables, and you say, oh, it's the so-and-so and the so-and-so and the prodigal son. and the Yeah, okay, so we know the parables. Actually, the parables are quite complicated. The parables are quite challenging. The parables need quite a lot of interpretation. How do you, how do you interpret the parable of the unjust judge, you know? The one who won't answer the widow's complaint. She says, I want justice against my enemy. And the judge says, no, I'm too busy. Go away. And she hammers on and she hammers on and she hammers on. And eventually he says, oh, all right, I will. And it's a parable about what God is like, what prayer is like. Well, what sort of a God do you think that's like? You know? Think of the laborers in the vineyard. So those are standing around all day and they go along at, 11, at the 11th hour and they get the same wages as the ones been working all day. Well, that's, quite a, that's not very straightforward. That requires a little bit of working out. So we're quite familiar, actually, with the need to interpret Scripture. So we just need to interpret the book of Revelation also. Some themes that we pick up in the book of Revelation. Numbers. Numbers occur a lot. I've mentioned seven already, but numbers occur a lot. And then we have these beasts... And there's, all, there's lots of beasts of all sorts, and they're all more fantastic than the previous one. There's a lot of detail about colour. Colour crops up. There are places, and some of the places are fictitious, and some of the places are unknown. There is angels, lots of angels, lots of angels. Lots of angels actually throughout Scripture. Most of the books of the Bible actually mention angels and have angels in them. The time sequence is one of those things which, which, which sometimes... You know, you're starting it off in what looks like the future, and then it's the past, and then it's the present. So there's a, there's a fluidity. There's a fluidity. So it's not a story which starts at this date and goes through to that date. It goes back and forth. Lots of images of warfare and violence, and they're quite graphic. I mean, you know, rivers of blood. Nasty, st- the sort of stuff which you know on the BBC News they'd say uh, some some vision might prefer not to watch these images. It's that it's that sort of graphic, and then there's hope and the promise of salvation. Just a little flick of that. If I said to you nine eleven, you'd you would immediately know what I meant. If I'd said that to you fifteen years ago, you'd have said what? You know, it's one of those numbers now which is fixed and it's got a very clear meaning. You know, nine eleven, thirteen. You know, we say, oh yeah, hotels. Lots of hotels in America don't have a thirteenth floor. You know, so numbers like that. So, you know, we're used to the idea that numbers have a meaning which is not necessarily there in the thing. So that's what we've got. We've got numbers which have a meaning in that context or at the, that time, which confuse us, and we say, well, why? You know, why these strange numbers? Why uh, three, seven, three and a half, twelve, 144, 1,000? It's fairly, you know, fairly straightforward. 12 is a very significant number, and 12 times 12, and, you know, those, those, those are numbers which are around 1,000. Three and a half, it's half of seven. 
So sometimes it's, sometimes it's described in the book as 42 months. And you think, well, what's a very precise number? Or 1,260 days. Well, that's three and a half years. And that's half of seven, which is the whole. So, so some of these numbers, if you do a little bit of thinking about liberty research, it's not, it's not actually totally mystical. The beasts, the beasts come out of the Old Testament. They come out of Ezekiel and Daniel. And they're described in those books of the Bible. And they are graphic representations of evil of evil. You know, we use words like monstrous because it's, it conjures up and uh, it's a very powerful image of, of evil. Colours. We're used to the idea of colours, you know. We're, we're, uh, white, a bride still wear white mainly. I've, I've done brides in other colours, but most of the time they, they wear white. Why? Because it's, it's a, it's a colour which has significance. You know, red has significance. So colours have significant places. Places. Read the Old Testament. What is the nastiest place in the world? It's Babylon. They're the real baddies. Babylon is horrendous. By the waters of Babylon, let's smash the babies' heads, you know. That's That's the great arch enemy. So if you want to talk about the arch enemy today, you wouldn't say the Palace of Westminster, you know, or or Moscow or Washington. You'd say Babylon. That's where it all starts. Angels, angels are, as I said, common in the Bible, messengers of God. And they, are, they, they make up God's armies. There are armies of the baddies, and there's God's armies, and God's armies are all angels. Time sequence, past, present, and future. Just think of, just think of celebrating the, the Mass when you go to liturgy. We're with the heavenly host. We're with Jesus on, uh, at Calvary. We're, 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 you, know, you do things in faith which are outside normal time sequence. That's what is going on here. And then finally, rewarding the good and punishing the bad. It's, it's a sort of a, a classic human way of dealing with things. Whether it's little children... Do that again and I'll smack you. And not that not you're allowed to, but you know, I'll do that and I'll smack you. Or you were very good, here's a sweetie. That's what we do, isn't it? We do it with little ones. And that's that's and actually we'd like that to happen to us too. We'd like all the naughty people to be smacked, and we'd like all us good people to be given sweeties or the equivalent. And we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Sometimes some of the some of the Im- images, by the way, are just because I found them on Google and I really liked them. If you, want, if you want a little pastime sometime, just Google the Book of Revelation. It's really it's marvellous. So, where does the material for the Book of Revelation come from? Well, there's 348 allusions to the Septuagint. That's what LXX means. It's a shorthand for the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the Bible in Greek, which was very common at the time of Jesus and before. That was the, that was the version which most people used most of the time. Because Greek was the common language throughout the Mediterranean and the Septuagint had been translated and was, was received and was passed around. Now, not quotations, not quotations, but allusions. So he hasn't just picked out words or phrases, he's referred to them. But if you're a scholar and you get a grant from anybody, you can spend hours and hours, days and days, years and years, finding them all out and putting them all down. 348 allusions to the Old Testament, to the to the. Septuagint. Allusions to the book of Enoch, I mentioned before, an apocalypse and other Jewish sources. Possible allusions to the Sibylline oracles, which are a, a Greek original collection of oracles of various sorts. There's a suggestion that one of the figures in there is, is a, 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 a reborn Nero leading the Parthian army from the east. So there are suggestions. You know, a bit like sometimes those prophecy, prophecy of Malachi about the next pope or the last pope or the pope to come. Those sort of, or Nostradamus, you know, th- those sort of things people find fascinating. But the author is original and he's imaginative. He's not simply derivative. It's actually a, a masterpiece in many ways, the book of, Re- book of Revelation. A masterpiece. He addresses real people in real situations. These are seven churches, as I've read before. And he deliberately writes in an, an, an enigmatic way. He deliberately writes it in a way which, which intrigues people. And they want to find out more, get him more engrossed in it. Just like if you're writing a, you know, sometimes you read novels and you get totally caught up in it. And you're engrossed in the whole world that the author's created. And that's what he's managed to do. 
to draw people in. This is where he gets some of his ideas from. So from the book of Ezekiel, you have your four living creatures, which are around the throne. You have the figure on the throne, you have, and the throne is full of gold and, and gems. You have the image of eating a scroll, which John does. The image of the harlot, which is the city, the wicked city. In, in, in Ezekiel, it's Tyre. You have the image of the measuring the temple, which happens again in, in Revelation. And you have these whoever they are, Gog and Magog, which appear in Ezekiel, which appear in the book of Revelation. Zechariah, the last prophet of the Old Testament. You have vision with angels, and you have lampstands. You have four colored horses, which appear in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You have your shepherds, and you have this ideal city of Jerusalem. You know, the ideal city, which is like a person. The book of Daniel, you have the monstrous beasts. You have the Son of Man crowned. You have these 70 weeks as a time, these periods, you have battles in heaven, and you have afterlife. Remember, most of the Old Testament, most of the Old Testament, there's no idea of an afterlife. It isn't until books like Daniel come along. A lot of the images are have more than one interpretation. So we have a woman appears in chapter twelve of Revelation, and she gives birth. So that's Israel giving birth to the Messiah. But it's also, is it the church and her children? Is it the bride of the Lamb? And a lot of Christians, of course, today would actually see in it as Mary. It's the reading we use for the Feast of the Assumption. So you have an image there, which we can interpret in different ways. And that's fine. Because there isn't just one image and one way of doing it. And opposite the woman, who have the wings, who gives birth, we have the the harlot, the other woman, <coughs> whose name is Babylon, who in fact is Rome. Probably, I mean, that's without much interpretation. If she sits on seven hills, well, you know, and she she is ruler of the world, so it's it's, it's Rome. Great wealth at others' expenses. Fornication is a great sin, and remember, in scriptural terms, fornication is always idolatry. It's always having many gods. Is always worshipping other things than the one God. And she's, as you can see there, she's drinking blood because the ruthlessness of Rome was, ex was experienced. As I say, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of, of, of Jerusalem. Okay, so what happens? John has a vision. He writes seven letters, or he dictates seven letters of seven churches. He sees heaven and the throne and God and the heavenly court. There are seven seals on a document which are opened. And as they are opened, there are terrific signs, most of them fairly destructive, some of them f a bit positive. Seven trumpets are sounded, again, mostly with with disastrous consequences for some people in some places, and some positive ones. There are seven figures. I put the question mark there because, again, it's one of those things. Is do you, how do you just, which figure is which? So there's the figure of the woman. There's the dragon. There's the child. And then there's the three beasts. And then there's the lamb that was slain. Seven bowls of woe ending in Jer Babylon being destroyed. The marriage feast of the lamb and the judgment of the forces of evil, who are thrown into the, a lake of burning sulfur. And finally, there's a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, that's the sort of outline of what happens. Let's, let's actually have a, let's have a little listen to some of it. I'm just going to read you nine small extracts from the book of Revelation. I've got some pretty pictures if you don't want to listen to me. <coughs> so, this is how it opens. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show his servants what must happen soon. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who gives witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ by, by reporting what he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. That's me. That's why I'm reading it aloud. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. And blessed are those who listen to this prophetic message and heed what is written in it, for the appointed time is near. So it's about listening. And remember, Scripture actually is meant to be read aloud. Yeah. So if, you, if you're sitting in your, your pew reading a little mass sheet, you're very naughty. So it's a prophecy, and it's addressed to John, and it's from God for 
It's gone off. It's shutting down. Don't do that to me. <coughs> Let's try and carry with just one. I don't know why it's done that. <laughs> Thank you, Reuben. <laughs> See if you can find me. Sorry, is it? The second, the second little passage, it's, it's, it's one of the seven letters, and it's the one to Smyrna. I've chosen the one to Smyrna because it's quite short, and it's very positive. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this. The first and the last, who once died but came to life, says this. I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but rather are members of the assembly of Satan. Do not be afraid of anything that you are going to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will face an ordeal for ten days. Remain faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Whoever has ears ought to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor shall not be harmed by the second death. So Smyrna is obviously a place where people are struggling. They're having a difficult time. And he's writing specifically to them to say, yeah, it's bad. But you're actually you're, you're doing all the right things. Hold on and you will, you will get the reward that's given to you. It's addressed to the, a people in a real situation. The one to Laodicea is very interesting, which is, the, which is the people who get a real telling off. And this is one of the reasons why we know how specific these are. Laodicea was well known for its banking. It had lots of banks. And its cloth material, cl- clothing industry. And it had a medical school where they specialised in eyes because they had a, a special o- ointment which they developed. So they have money, they have clothing, they have medicine for eyes. And he says to them, you are poor, you are naked and you are blind. Laodicea has hot springs on that side and cold drinking water on that side. And he says, you're neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. So it's graphic stuff, but it's actually tied in to the reality of these places. So it's not just, it's not just, uh, you know, off the top of his head. A little vision of heaven. So after he's written to this, to this he goes up to heaven at once. I was caught up in the spirit. A throne was there in heaven. And on the throne sat one whose appearance sparkled like jasper and carnelian. Around the throne was a halo as brilliant as an emerald. Surrounding the throne I saw 24 other thrones. On which 24 elders sat. Dressed in white garments with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning rumbling and peals of thunder. Seven flaming torches burned in front of the throne which are the seven spirits of God. In front of the throne was something resembled a sea of glass like crystal. In the centre and round the throne were the four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back. So it's this extraordinary image, but actually it's an image of an imperial court. I mean, there's the emperor, and he's got his subject kings around him, and he's got the, the glory and the power and the might. And, you know, one of the ways we talk about God... The, the language we use about God, almighty, all-powerful, majestic. This is all images which he picks up and moves on. Sorry, I didn't uh, didn't give you the picture of that one, did I? There it is. So there's the the elders and there's John and the four being creatures. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude. This is a few chapters further on, which no one could count from every nation. This is one of the readings which is there on the Feast of All Saints. From every nation, race, people and tongue, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hand. They cried aloud in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne worshipped God and acclaimed, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honour, power and might, be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. It's an imperial scene, but it's also a liturgy. It's a liturgy. They're singing God's praises, just like, you know, when you're there in church on Sunday morning with your hymn books, and the choir master trying to lead you. Yeah, that's what happens. 
we have the trumpets then. So here's one of the trumpets. Triumph and disaster. Trumpet and disaster. With the angel, seventh, sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice come from the four horns of the gold altar before God, telling the sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the banks of the great river Euphrates. Euphrates, the great river which runs through the Middle East. The four angels were released, who were prepared for this hour, day, month, and year to kill a third of the human race. The number of cavalry troops was 200 million. I heard their number. Now in my vision, this is how I saw the horses and their riders. They wore red, blue, and yellow breastplates. And the horses' heads were like heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. By these three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of the mouths, a third of the human race was killed. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like snakes with heads that afflict harm. So it's a fairly big graphic image. And I suspect if you were describing or talking about the the enemy, you'd probably use language like that. I suspect in the trenches in the First World War, The book of Revelation would have had quite a lot of relevance to people. And here's the lady. One of the seven angels said to me, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, who lives near many waters. The kings of the earth have had intercourse with her, and the inhabitants of the earth became drunk on the wine of her holotry. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a deserted place, where I saw a woman seated on a scarlet beast, that was covered with blasphemous names, with seven heads and ten horns. The woman was wearing purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls. Oh, that's the beast. Sorry, I missed the beast. I didn't see the beast. Sorry. Here we are, harnessed again. She held in her hand a gold cup that was filled with the abominable and sordid deeds of her harlotry. On her forehead was written a name, which is a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the world. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem. Remember, if the old Jerusalem has been destroyed, a new Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain for the old order has passed away. That's the promise. And the book ends. I warn everyone who hears the prophetic words in this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words in this prophetic book, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city described in the book. The one who gives this testimony says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. So it ends in prayer. And we need to remember that, that the the book is something to be heard. Blessed are those who have ears. So, if we're listening to Revelation, the book of Revelation, here's a few points to look at. How to use the Bible properly. Revelation, and now by which I mean the general idea of Revelation, is ultimately God's condescension. God reveals God's self to humankind. We don't discover God. We don't invent God. We don't. God reveals God's self. And God, Revelation is manifold in many ways. We can perceive, we can, we can find out about God through creation, through the moral law, through our own conscience, through sacred scripture, through tradition, through teaching. You know, God reveals God's self in many ways. And I'm sure if we had the time and went through everybody's history of faith here, there would be many and varied ways in which it happened. And re- humankind receives revelation. 
So we don't invent it, we don't make it up, we receive it. And the book of Revelation is so called because it reveals something of God. So, a little bit of formal teaching now. What does the church teach about scripture, which is relevant to when we want to look at a book like Revelation? Okay, so scripture must be taken as a whole. Any passage or any book is seen in a bigger context and the pride of place is given to the Gospels. So if you have a text which says one thing and a text which says something else, you need to put them in their context. You need to put them in the picture of the whole Bible. You remember Jesus says, because it says in the Old Testament, it says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus says, you know how it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Well, I say to you, do not. Yeah? So it's true to say in the Bible, eye for eye, truth for tooth. It's, it is there. But actually, for us as Christians, the gospel goes beyond that, because Jesus said beyond that. And if you want to take things, and the, and the, the absolute perfect one is, is there's, a, there's a quotation in one of the Psalms. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, you just take out there is no God, and you say, look, the Bible says there is no God. Now, it's nonsense, isn't it, of course, because you have to put things in their context. And that's all we're saying there is, things go in a context. You can't just pluck something out and say, that's the answer. Well, you can do, but it's not, it's not licit. Scripture must be taken with tradition. Tradition simply means the passing on. And that's because you know, our understanding is the Scripture comes through the church and its understanding. The Quran is dictated by Muhammad, who couldn't read or write, from the Archangel Gabriel. That's the, that's the story of, of the Quran. So it comes directly from God without any human involvement. We don't believe that about the Bible. It's not dictated by God. It's given by God through human beings. And it's the church which actually, in faith, through the Holy Spirit, determines what is scripture. In the first, the, 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 what we call the canon of scripture, the books of the Bible, are not fixed until the end of the fourth century. So for 400 years, the church was using the scriptures, not quite sure, does this one fit? Well, I think we like that one instead, you know. So it, it's not a... The idea that the Bible just drops out of heaven, which, which, which some Christians would have us believe, is simply not the case. And that certainly is not our understanding. And scripture must be interpreted with the magisterium, the teaching authority within the church. Just as you know perfectly well... You can go to any book of the Bible and if you've got enough um, uh, nows, no, if, you, if you've got enough, um, you can prove almost anything just by plucking things out. But actually, actually, the Catholic understanding is scriptures belong in the community. You know, the place for scripture, above all, is in the liturgy, where the people are assembled in faith and in prayer to ponder it. It's not a rule book. It's not a code book. It's not a, a proof text store. It's more than that. Dei Verbum is one of the four constitutions from the Second Vatican Council on Revelation. And this is two things it quotes. To compose the sacred books, so we're thinking of Revelation in this case, God chose certain men. Um, this, this, is, this is the translation from 1963, so it's, uh, <coughs> it's not as inclusive as it might have been. Made who made full use of their powers and faculties. It was as true authors that they consigned to writing whatever he wanted written. That's why the styles in the books are different. That's why some of them put things in different order in a different way, because they're, they're inspired writings, but they are real authors. You know, there is a real man called John of Patmos who wrote this, and he used his own skills and his own ability and his own imagination to write the book. A second question, quote. In determining the intention of the sacred writers, attention must be given inter alia to literary forms. For the fact is that truth is differently presented and expressed in various types of historical writing in prophetical and poetical texts, and in other forms of literary expression. You know, if you read Wordsworth's um, I Wandered Lonely as a, Flat, as a Cloud, you wouldn't be reading it in order to find out the botanical de details about daffodils. You'd go to the Reader's Digest book of household plants for that. You know. 
Different types of writing are for different purposes. So if you write poetry, it's not for information. If I'm writing an instruction book on how to use my computer, which I could really do with, if I could, then I wouldn't do it in poetic language. I'd do it as practical as possible. If I'm writing history, I'm doing one sort of writing. If I'm doing, writing a novel, I'm writing a different sort of writing. And it's really important to, to bear those things in mind. Because if we think it's all the same, then we end up with confusion and, one might say, nonsense. I like that, Angel. Okay, so the, the book of the Apocalypse, or the Revelation, is partly about the last days. So what time is it now? It is the end of time to date. You know, we, we tend to see everything as having led up to the 27th, 27th? 27th of, Ju 27th of, Ju 27th of June, 2014. This is, this is the moment everything's led up to. Well, actually, that's... But actually, probably there's another... Is it five billion years of the solar system still going? Something like that? About five billion? Seven, yeah. So, so we're, we're actually really... We're really actually at the very beginning. How much longer do we have? People have always thought of their time was the last time. The first writing in the New Testament is Paul's letter, first letter to Thessalonians, which was probably written in 50 or 51 AD. So within less than 20 years after Jesus. And he already in that is assuming that Jesus is going to come along any moment now. It's the end of the world, perhaps next Friday. Yeah. So people have always had that idea. Do you remember uh, this? So, sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself now. No, which way am I going? That's it. That one. That's it. That one. That one. Do you remember the uh, Mayan prophecy that was the world was going to end on the twenty first of December, twenty twelve? I didn't buy any Christmas presents that year because there was no point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was it was one of those many many times in my lifetime that the world is going to end on a particular day. Well, okay. So it just people are always expecting it and they're always talking about it. So, you know, the fact that it's in the book of, the Revel of Revelation isn't actually evidence for one thing or the other about that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. You know, I, I described that, some of that scene in the throne of, of God as, as like liturgy. It's like a liturgy. It's like the liturgy we celebrate every Sunday. You know, the, the, the preface leads up to the Eucharistic prayer and so with angels and archangels with thrones and dominions and with all the hosts and powers of heaven we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts you and I every time we celebrate the Eucharist every time we're at Mass we are as it were in John's understanding gathered at the throne of the Lamb in that scene in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation yeah, it's that. It's that's the image he's on about. That's what's going on. The apocalypse. Gosh, five minutes. <clears throat> the apocalypse. The apocalypse. When things are so bad that they cannot be sorted out from within history, but they need outside intervention. You know, things are so bad. We're not going to sort this one out. It's such an awful mess. Some. some you know, we, we need the seventh cavalry to arrive. As it were, I wonder what it's like as a Christian in Syria and Iraq reading the book of Revelation. I suspect you'd probably identify with the people in Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, where things are really bad and you can't see any way out. And the book of Revelation would, would be the, the sort of thing that you would say, we must hold on to that. We must hold on to that because that is our promise of our hope. I like that sign for the secret nuclear bunker. It's rather good. <laughs> secret, a road sign, secret nuclear bunker. Secrets that are known. So it's a secret, but actually, if you tell enough people about it, and that's what the book of Revelation, these are all secrets, but actually, pass it on. Pass it on. Jesus says in the gospel about, there are signs, look out for the signs. Look for the signs of the times. And we do that, 
to encourage people. John writes names to misna- by misnaming. So we can't talk about Nero, but we can talk about 666. Yeah. Hyperbole. We write something huge and great. Just, just to say to people, however bad it gets, actually keep going. And like Jesus' parables, it reveals to some while hiding from others. And there's Nero, who looks, looks a bit like him, um, whatever his name is. Well, I'll leave you to decide that. Mark of the Beast. 666. Numbers as, as letters. It was a very common thing. You know, there's the, the, the genealogy in Matthew's Gospel. 14 sets, 3 times 14. You put the numbers together and it ends up with the equivalent of David which is, you know, one of those key names in the scripture. So numbers, playing with numbers, one of those things people do. Um, if you Google Antichrist, you end up with um, quite a lot of Obama, actually. Quite a lot. Which says a lot about the American um, <coughs> churches, doesn't it? And the other one, of course, is uh, dear Papa Fran- Frank Francisco. So, you know, the Antichrist... Whoever your enemy is, that's who the Antichrist is. So that's, 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 that's what we get. We actually get Antichrist in the New Testament, in those references, even in the Gospels, reference to false prophets. The Antichrist is when you're trying to do something and someone is trying to deliberately undermine your work. You know, when you're trying to do something and someone's deliberately... You know, There's Pope Leo X. This looked with surrounded by his beasts. We use the book of Revelation because it is so powerful and its images are so strong. And yet it's, delib- it's, yet it's deliberately vague. And therefore you can interpret it to fit your situations. That's why it's been... So. so people have looked at their own time and said, Ah, look, Pope Leo X, that's, that's he's the one there in the book of Revelation. It works particularly well in times of strong confrontation because it's emotive. The language is powerful, it's imaginative, it's emotional. But there are other ways. Also in the New Testament, we have what we call the pastoral epistles. These are the late letters attributed to uh, to Paul, Titus, and 1 and 2 Timothy. And actually what he's going on about there is is saying, um, you know, um, Get on with the authorities. Uh, don't cause a fuss. Uh, pray for the king. Pray for the rulers. Uh, you know, be good. N- be good. Live sober Christian life, so people won't be upset by you. So they won't. They won't persecute you. So they won't attack you. They won't try and get rid of you. Just fit in. Fit in. So there's an alternative. You know, stand out or we fit in. And I think if. Um, John of, of Patmos were to speak to the Paul of uh, Timothy and Titus. I think they wouldn't see this eye to eye at all. John's is written to communities where there are issues. I said these are real communities of seven churches. What are the issues? It's emperor worship. It's become emperor worship starts actually in Asia Minor. Augustus and the and the rest of the Roman emperors are divinized there. Petition from dear emperor, can we write? Can we build a temple to you to, as as a god? You know, oh, what a nice tem- what a nice city that is. Oh, we'll we'll let them off the taxes, or we'll send them we'll send them a sort of a, a letter of commendation. So it's in Asia Minor particularly that emperor worship is going on. If you're someone who believes the only God is the God, then actually deifying the emperor becomes something which is a real challenge. Compromise with the state. The Romans. The, the Romans. It's nice and secure. We're nice and safe. We got we got good drainage. And we've got police on the corners of the street and on a, on a postal service. Oh, let's stay with the Romans because, you know, they, 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 may, they, they may have lots of gods. They may want to put, get rid of Christians, but actually it's a nice, it's a nice safe world. So that's the challenge for John's communities, that they might compromise. They might go for success. They might go for financial prosperity. Since the Romans took over, we've actually, you know, we're actually all doing very nicely. Thank you very much. Those are the compromise. That's the, the the challenge for John's community. So, what's the challenge for the church today? What might be the challenges? Materialism, the success ethic, individualism, 
market forces. Oh, I'm sorry about your savings, your pension. <gasps> it's just one of those things, you see, isn't it? The vulnerable, well, yeah, I know, vulnerable people, but oh, just the way it goes, I'm sorry. Choice? Well, you must have a choice. You must choose. You must have your, cho- your, your choice must be put before anybody else's need. And the usefulness, well, that's how you, that's how you judge people's value. How useful are you? Now, these, these might be, these might be the sort of challenges for us that John's, John might be asking us to look at. We have a very graphic picture in the book of Revelation. There's the beast, the harlot, and, the, um, and all their armies, and there's the, the image of God and the Lamb. And the question is, whose side are you on? The author asks the people of the seven churches to reflect on where they are. Are they with the beast, or are they with the saints? And you, and me? And what does it mean for you and me and how do we live? I so suppose it's, it's never easy, as if someone like me especially, it's never easy to stand out from the crowd. What would you stand up for? What would you get worked up about? What would the government or the next government or the government after that have to do to make you say, as a Christian, I am not prepared to stand up for this, that or t'other? Because that's the question behind the book of Revelation. always works is us and them that's one of those great images think of football teams political parties you know in in Sherborne it's either are you you for the conservatives or are you UKIP it's either you've got to choose it's one or the other are you for Manchester United or are you Manchester City there was a great scandal in the diocese when Father Paddy died, Father Paddy uh, Dorian, because he was always known to be a Marks and Spencers man, but he dropped dead in Sainsbury's Isle. <laughs> you know? It was, it's, this, it's this dichotomy. It's a challenge. Which are you for? And the great question, who is Lord over the world? Who is, who is the emperor? Who is the, 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 the one who has total control? Christians represent the authority of Christ's eschatological power. The eschatological power means that the power of the end of time. And yet we're subject to the political powers of their time. And you and I are not accepted. So we would say Jesus is Lord, but actually um, I'll, I'll obey the rules of the government. And I'll, and I'll drive on the, ru- the, ru- the which side of the road I'm meant to be driving. I'll drive, you know, I'll do that and I'll keep my speed limit. Accommodation for a lot of John's people, is counts as idolatry and immorality. It's, it's being on the side of the whore of Babylon because the central motif of the thr- throne is God's authority. Are you telling me I'm going to stop? Why? Is, sort of. Yeah, okay, okay. I'll, just, I'll be very quick, okay? No, no, just, I, I don't want to keep people away from their coffee. So the strength... So the, 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 the book of Revelation works because the language and the, and, and the imagery is powerful. And it works at an imaginative level. It's not a detailed theological treatise. It's not a detailed historical treatise. It's a, a work of imagination. And that's why it engages people. And we've got to remember that that's why it works. Because it, 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 it gets you emotionally involved. It gets reactions and convictions that cannot be fully conceptualized or posited in logical or propositional language. So the language is not the, the, the language of a, of a catechism. It's not the language of a rule book. It's not the language of a code of set of instructions. Revelation as poetry, read aloud, symbolic and musical. Think of it as an opera. Don't try this at home. So, final slide. Where have we arrived? The author of Revelation did not know when and how the world would end. That's, if you you take nothing else away from that, please take that away from that. I hope you take more than that. The author of Revelation did not know when and how the world would end. If we read the book of Revelation, we read it as a whole. It is addressed to seven churches in first century AD. It has a context and a proper audience. And if we ignore that, then we just get into conspiracy theory. However, because of the way it's written, it does invite us to engage with 
another way of looking at things. Things which are not just simply measurable, scientific, cold and calculating. And actually, a lot of being human is actually being other than that. You know, we think of our passion, our music, our art, all the things that pull us out of ourselves. It addresses issues of how the faithful relate to secular culture and government. We live in our culture. We can't step outside it. So how do we live with it? How do we, how do we avoid picking up from the culture a sort of attitude which our gospel would say isn't right? That's the challenge. Encourage the powerless and challenge the comfortable. That's what the book of Revelation tries to do. And there's a little picture to finish with. Thank you.